Hello everyone, it is 11.20, 20 past 11 on Monday the 27th of April. Um, welcome back for another live broadcast from the Prince of Wales Virtual School. I hope you've had a good morning so far. Um, I hope you've been taking on the Shakespeare Challenge this morning. We are looking at five plays in five days in association with the Shakespeare's in Schools Foundation. Um, I've already seen some examples of work being sent in this morning, and it's great to see everybody embracing Twelfth Night this morning. Um, excellent challenge for you all. Um, and remember, over the next five days, one of the plays that we're going to cover will be the play that year four next year, so our current year three, will perform in uh, in October, November time at Wayne Pavilion. So uh, we're not going to reveal that just yet, but it will be one of the five plays that we're looking at over the coming days. I can see lots of people are joining us live, um, 15 or 16 families already joining us at this moment in time. I'm sure that number is going to rise now. Yeah, I can see the numbers going up, which is brilliant. Um, if you're here, do say hello. Put a comment in the comment box. Uh, we've got a hi, guys. That's from Benji. A uh, Good morning, Mr. Spracklin from Arthur. Thank you very much, Arthur. It's great to see you. Uh, good morning, Benji. I thought that was you. Uh, wonderful to see you this morning and uh, welcome to our very special assembly time. It's that time again, 20 past 11. And uh, ooh, who else is here? Hugo and Harlan are here. Good morning, Hugo and Harlan. Great to see you this morning, boys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning from Harry and George who are tuning in. Hello, Harry and George. I trust you both well. Uh, good morning from the Billingham boys. Good morning, Billingham boys. Wonderful to see you this morning, Henry and Charlie. Uh, good morning from the Bakers. Thank you very much, Bakers. Good to see you this morning. It was great to see your photos this morning on Good Morning at Power. You've been super busy with those chalk drawings. Uh, hello, everyone from Alfie. Thank you for tuning in, Alfie. Uh, good, morning, good morning from Mrs. Hall, who's watching us this morning. Good morning, Mrs. Hall. Hello from the Dovell family. Hello from the Scott family who are tuning in. Hello from Orson and Ursula. Uh, Florence is here as well. George and Evie are here. Jacob and Ralph say hi. Thank you very much, Jacob and Ralph, for joining us. Uh, good morning from William, who's watching us this morning. Thank you very much. Lots and lots of people here this morning, which is great news because we've got a fantastic guest joining us. Um, I want to say a big good morning to Stuart McLeod. Good morning, Stuart. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Very well, thank you. What a lot of people watching this. I hope I don't bore them silly. <laughs> I have every confidence you won't, Stuart. Stuart, do you want to introduce yourselves, uh, yourselves, yourself even, and let everyone know who you are and why you're joining us this morning? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Stuart. You can call me Stuart. Um, I used to be a head teacher on Portland, and, and I used to work with Mr. Spacklin. And he and I were colleagues together on Portland. I retired a few years ago. And I now spend my time when I can getting out and doing metal detecting. So today I thought I'd bring along some of the things I've found just to show you. Um, and hopefully it might inspire some of you to become interested in history as well. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Stuart. And we've got some slides here today to share. So I'm going to pop those up. Well, no, can we just wait for them? Because I, I need yeah, to show some other things first. Is that all right? Yeah, I'll put you full screen, Stuart. There we go. There we go. Okay, well, um, metal detecting. So I don't know if you know what it's all about. You, you take a, a, a machine and you go out into fields. and uh, But you do need permission from the landowners, the farmers, before you go out there. So you can't just go digging up your parents' gardens. You must get permission mission because that's essential but you need a metal detector and they have some ideal ones uh, for young children so um, if you're interested just let me know I can point in the right direction of how to go about it when you go out uh, detecting it's a bit like fishing you can spend hours and hours and hours all day and you might find nothing. So what I'd start today is show you some of the greatest finds I've ever found before Mr. Spracklin shows you some of the things I've also found. So these are things that I find very regularly. And it's this. It's, um, yeah, I think you know what that is. It's meant to be lucky. 
but uh, it's not lucky for me at all. There's a lot of horses around there without their hooves or their, sh their horseshoes. Um, and we find a lot of these. I'll just clean my computer from all the muck there. Do you know what that is? It's a bit squashed. If I turn it this way, you might know, find out what it is. Maybe some of the mums and dads might know. The, any ideas, Mr. Spackler? Oh, is that? I think he's got uh, it, it, it Well, it looks a bit, it, from the angle that I'm looking at, it looks like a bit like an ax head or something like that. I wish it was. It's a thimble. Ah, thimble. And you find a lot of these in the fields. People must have done a lot of repairs to their clothes and sacks and things in the fields. So you find a lot of thimbles. This one's squashed. But you find a, a, an awful amount of these. The biggest thing we find a lot of are these things. Any idea what that is? Mm, sure. Well, that's a button. Ah. So if you think, uh, here's a button on my shirt, and if you look at the size of that button there, and then compare that with what people were wearing 200 years ago, this is called a dandy button. And uh, somebody must have been quite upset to have lost that, but you find a lot a lot of these in the fields. In fact, you find so many buttons. Uh, there's a lot of these uh, here. Uh, I think a lot of the people two or three hundred years ago must have been walking around with their trousers falling down because we find buckles and buttons. Uh, their shoes must have been all over the place and their clothes must have been falling off. Well, there you go. Now, you find these as well, and you've got to be very careful with these. This is, any ideas? I'll give you a minute to have a, a look and a think of what it might be. What do we think? Have to be air. Yeah. Well, this is a, a bullet from the 1940s, from the Second World War. Wow. And quite, quite occasionally, you end up on a farm and the farmer said, no, we've never had anybody to de detect here before. And you realize why, because uh, people used to practice uh, firing their guns there in World War II. And uh, so you have to be ever so careful. And uh, you do need an adult around with you because sometimes, well, it could be live, couldn't it? And you have to be very, very careful. Now you find lots of things like this. And this is made of lead. And this is a pistol shot from the 1700s. And someone has fired this bullet, and that's a big bullet. Um, I don't know what they were firing it at. Maybe, maybe they were just doing it for target practice, but this is from a pistol. And then you get things like this. It should be easy to identify. And I think the person who lost this must have been quite upset when they got home or to the church or wherever they wanted to open the door because this was lost in the grass and was never found again for 200 years. I look like the magic key. In the class. I, 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 <laughs> well, when I was a head teacher, I would give that, give that to the children to write a story about whose key did that belong to Biff, Chip or Kipper? We've got a couple of other people saying hello. We've got um, good morning from the Hoffmans. We've got hello uh, from Benji, who says hi, Stuart. We've got Imogen hi. saying we've got Imogen saying hello as well. And interestingly, we've got Philippa here from Maiden Castle Farm. And I wonder, Philippa, maybe you could ask Mummy or Daddy, have you ever had any metal detector um, metal detectors going over your land on Maiden Castle Farm? I wonder. Wow. Well. <laughs> well, to get on Maiden Castle Farm would be a dream um, because that's very ancient land and a lot of it is protected, of course. We're not allowed to go near Maiden Castle itself uh, because uh, we don't want uh, people digging up all those archaeological ruins. But I thought 
I'd show you something that gives the best signal ever. And every time we get this signal, we think, oh, I found, I found the treasure trove. And it's this. <laughs> No, I don't think that's very ancient. I think this is about maybe three years old, and it's come, yeah, from a can, and it gives a signal that, oh, it's absolutely brilliant. You think, oh, this is a really good, I've got to dig this. And you can imagine how frustrating it is when you actually dig up a ring pool. But I thought I'd show you these and see if you know what these are before I show you some of the other things. Any ideas? If you can guess what they are, put it into the comments box, and we can put that. We can put those guesses up. It might take a couple of seconds for people to put them through. But while Stuart holds them there, if you've got an idea of what they might be, put them in the I'll comments. Box. What do you think they are? Uh, copper coins. Reese is here, and he thinks they're copper coins. Well, I think that's very good. That's very good. The problem I'm going to I'm going to show you is. These coins have been in the ground not for hundreds of years. This coin here is a pound, an old pound coin, and this has been in the ground for about 10 years. And this is what happens. You can see the queen's head there. Um, well done, Imogen. Um, that one was actually a pound. And this one, this is how bad a modern two pence coin can look after only a few years in the ground. Our modern coins don't last very long in the ground. So people metal detecting in 50 years time, well done, Katie. Uh, yeah, it's a two pence piece. And I don't know what people in the future will make of these modern coins. I don't think there's gonna be anything left of them. However, that's the, that's the not so interesting stuff. What you do find a lot of in the fields, and I've got plenty of spare, if any of you would like me to uh, give some to you, you find lots of this. And you find, obviously, a metal detector doesn't find things like this. Um, you have to just use your eyes. And uh, often these are lying on the surface. And if it's been raining, you can see there's a glaze on here and the rain picks up the glaze, so it's very easy to see. So you find lots of this, and any idea what this might be? It's not metal. I'll give you a clue, it's made of clay. Reese, any idea? Let's see if we've got any, uh, let's see if we've got any suggestions in the comment box as well. What do you think it is, Reese? Uh, clay pot. Some sort of clay pot, maybe, or? I Some... think that's great. I think you make a fantastic archaeology, Reese. Well done. This is part of a pot, and this part, the glazed side, is from the inside of the pot, where you would have your drinks or whatever was being cooked. Well done, Callie. Uh, and here's the outside. This is rough. So this was the outside. Holly thinks it's a clay pot. Fantastic. So you find lots of broken bits of pot. Here's another piece. This piece dates back to about the Roman times. And there's just loads and loads of broken pottery in the fields. So someone had a house and, uh, well done, Nicola, broken pot. There's lots and lots of, I've got bags full of broken pots. So if anyone's really interested in archeology span and you'd like to have some free of charge, well done, John. Uh, I can give them to Mr. Spracklin and he can give them to you because I collect them. Well done, Holly and um, Anna. Um, yep, yeah, Roman pottery. So, uh, oh, some other things that you will find with your eyes. I was really chuffed to find this. This is quite sharp. Can you think what it might be? Yeah. We're not sure here. I've got any suggestions. Well, it's made of flint. If I give you a clue that it's made of flint. And there's been a bit broken off just here. So what could it be used for, a bit of flint? 
Oh, so, oh uh, Orson spotted it. It was Flint. I don't know. Well done, Orson. Yeah, well, I'll, to, I'll just I'll, sharpen your weapon. to sharpen your weapon, something to sharpen your weapon, maybe. Well, I think that's a really good answer, that race. Um, I think all of you are onto it. This is from the Stone Age, so this is thousands of years old, and this is called a flint scraper. So people used another bit of flint to knock this into shape so that this this is really sharp this can still cut paper and your fingers if you weren't very careful and they used this to clean the animal skins uh, so that they could wear the animal skins and i found that just lying on top of a field one day now i've never been lucky to find one of these, I had to I had to buy this. So the flint is used to start a fire. So yeah, you're quite right, Imogen. I had to buy this one. And this is a flint. Yes, Lily, they did use them for cutting things. This is a spearhead, a Stone Age little spearhead. So this would be used for hunting. And the best thing I wish I could find, I'm still hoping to look for, is this. And that's an arrowhead, a Stone Age arrowhead. So that was, again, made of, well done, Nicola, that made of flint. John, brilliant. Oh, fantastic archaeologist here. And uh, this was used for hunting and uh, for fighting with as well. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to some of the, the slides. Um, <clears throat> I've asked Mr. Spracklin to load up some slides, some real pictures, so, so you can see better than me holding the things up for you. I've actually got those things in my hand here. What you're seeing here is something I did find, and this was in the village of Ashmore in North Dorset. And um, we were very lucky to get the fields for, for, <laughs> for, for Ashmore because... Uh, in a magazine, a farmer had put uh, an advert in the parish magazine saying, are there any metal detectors out there? Because I've got a problem. So we said, oh, how can we help? And the farmer said, you'll never believe this, but my son was had his hands inside a haystack and his ring came off his finger and he's lost his ring in the haystack. Are there any metal detectorists out there who could help me find? So instead of uh, find the ring, so instead of finding a needle in the haystack, we were able to find the ring in the middle of the haystack, and we found it. So the farmer said, "Well, let me give you uh, lots and lots of pound coins and ten pound notes and twenty pound notes and fifty pound notes to thank you." And we said, "No, no, just uh, let us um, detect on your land, please, and we'll share." anything of value with you. And so he let us detect on his fields. And that very same day, I was lucky to find this coin. Now, this is a, called a stator, a Celtic stator. So this was the coin, type of coin that's made of silver that was in use by the people before the Romans came and invaded Britain in AD 43. So this coin dates to about 50 years before the Romans came. And if you were walking around Dorset in those days, 50 years before the Romans, this is before Jesus was born, this is the type of coin, if you were a rich person, you might have had in your pouch. So this is called a Celtic stator. And you have to do a dance when you find one of these. So that was, I was quite chuffed to find that one. So our year three and fours are very familiar with the Celts, so they'll they'll know about that time. We are, we of course have our Celtic roundhouse at the Prince of Wales School. Oh, tell me about it! I wish I could detect on your grounds. <laughs> okay, so this was one. Uh, this was found. I found this. This is my first and only gold coin. Um, I've got it in my hands now. And um, there we go. This I thought was a bottle top, 
and I'll put it as close as I can to the camera. Oh, where is the camera? There we are. Um, and this is called a quarter noble coin. And uh, again, you have to do a dance when you find gold. So there's a lot of dancing involved when you, when you go up metal detecting. And luckily, we're on fields and nobody can see us. Uh, so this dates from a king called King Henry VI, and he went a bit mad, bless him. So this dates to about 1422 to 1470, and it's made of gold. So somebody would have been really, really upset to have lost this. <laughs> Orson, Orson, you do not want to dance. <laughs> this is never going to get on strictly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a plan to that question, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say it. <laughs> this would frighten young children. Okay, next, please. Right, now this one is the tiniest coin I've ever found, and this is the one I found only recently. All of these coins I've shown you have been handed in uh, to a lady called Kirsty, who works at County Hall in Dorchester, and she records everything, and it goes on to a special database. This is very tiny. You can see it shows one centimeter on the little graph on the side there, so it's less than one centimeter long. But this is, I think, is of all the things, this is the thing that's given me most pleasure. Um, it's so tiny. I've got it in my hand here. This, I was so pleased to get the signal, and you can imagine it's very tiny when, you, when you, you've got a big clump of soil and you manage to go through it and, oh, oh, I wonder what this is. And uh, what Kirsty has told me, and it's now recorded on the database, is this is a, a Saxon, an Anglo-Saxon coin dating from the year 700 to 725. So it's, it's a, quite a rare Saxon coin called a skeet. So if you find a stator, you have to do a dance. If you find a gold coin, you have to do a dance. And if you find a skeet, um, again, yeah, yeah, you have to do a dance, yes. Strictly metal detecting. Okay, moving on. Right, now I'm going to show you a video, and this is the best thing I suppose I've ever found. It's only one minute long, so bear in mind, uh, it won't bore you too long, children. Don't worry. There is light at the end of the tunnel. I'll put, the, I'll put this full screen and get, give it a play. Here we go. Give it in a hole. A bit more out. As you can see, it's definitely a jug of some sort. We're just debating if it is silver or pewter. To me, it looks silver. The defence says it might be pewter. But we shall see. Got a bit more dug out. Definitely a jug. Found a little bit of a handle or knob on the handle at the top up here. Don't seem to be much underneath it at the moment. Hard to say until we get it out and detect the ground a bit more. Don't know if there's anything to the side of it, and we don't know if there's anything in it yet. Lodged in there, lovely. Don't put your hand underneath that, Stuart. Just there we go. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that was, um, I guess some people would say, the find of a lifetime. I'd only been de detecting a few years, and I managed to find what was a large, a really large silver jug in the ground. And it was like that. We always take cameras out with us when we go detecting, and this was on the 7th of July 2013 in a place called Little Breedy, which is not far from Dorchester, just a few miles away from Dorchester to the west. 
and we were out there at six o'clock in the morning. It was a very hot day. And by nine o'clock, I was thinking, mm, I, this is going to be a one long hot day and finding nothing. And then I started hitting this large signal. And so I started digging and digging. And I thought, oh dear, I, I found a drain. And what you do is you put your hand along it to see if the drain leads off somewhere else, normally down to the sheep pen. And it wasn't a drain. And so I kept digging. <clears throat> now, if you look at the bottom of the jug, you can see a big dent, can't you? Right on the, on the base at the bottom of the, the jug. And that's where my spade went. Not my proudest moment. Uh, <laughs> and then I found out that it was a jug. And um, I thought it might be something from World War II, but there'd been reports of planes, German planes being shot down nearby. Farmer told us to look out for bits of German plane, but this clearly was no German plane. So, <clears throat> yeah, there we are, and finding that. And if you're interested in seeing it come out of the ground, the video, um, if you go onto YouTube, and I've written this down, if you, if you just put in the words 1635 and then ewer, because it's, it's called a ewer, not a jug, um, and you just put 1635, because that's when it was made. That's all you have to put in, 1635, and then a space, and then ewer. And um, we put this up on YouTube, and we've had, so far, last night, I, I thought I'd, I'd better check, 476,000 people <laughs> looking at it with various comments, uh, some saying, oh, you've, it's a fake. Um, and I can assure you it's, it's not, because when we dug it out of the ground, we had to then give it to Kirsty. And I think uh, Mr. Spracklin's got some photographs at Kirsty, the Fines Liaison Officer. So that's, that's, that's me having got it out the ground. Now, many people do not believe that silver, this is a silver jug, a silver ewer, and it would have held water, not wine. I wanted it to hold wine. I actually wanted it to be full of coins, but it was something that would have held water. And a young person would have brought this to a table and there would have been a huge silver plate underneath there holding the ewer on top of it. And there would, the young person would pour the water into the big bowl, the plate, and we can't find the... The plate, it's called a chalice. We can't find the chalice. We're looking. Every time we go out, we look for the chalice. Somebody somewhere knows where it is. But the, the biggest question we've got is, why did someone put that in the ground? And we've got another video. If you go to that YouTube video, uh, the 1635 Space Ewer, thank you, Mr. Spike. I can see it on the, the thing there. This is what it looks like. Um, and this, we, we, we were lucky, we were invited to the British Museum because this was called one of the best, the top five finds from 2013. So in January 2014, we were invited to the British Museum and uh, we met the Minister for Culture there and all the people saying, oh, this is spectacular. Um, and there's a professor, there's another video, so just check on the, the videos on the, on the side of this. And uh, there's a professor, Dr. Dora Thornton, from the British Museum there. And she says, well, it's gleaming silver because it was wrapped in straw. And the straw has worn away over the years, over the 300 years that it's been lying in the ground. And that's what's protected the gleaming silver look. Most people would say, oh, it would be tarnished, be dirty and black. But no, it came out the ground gleaming silver. So the question nobody can answer is why was that put in the ground? Why was it put sideways? And also, when you watch the full video, you'll see it was full of soil. So 
there's a creative writing story for for year six. Who knows? I do, I I do not know. I think what we think is is that it was buried in a hurry. Someone dug a big hole, put soil into it to keep it looking like a jug. They didn't want it crushed. They were going to go back later on. They wrapped it in straw and they buried it in a hurry. Now, this ewer was made in London in 1635. And in 1642, only seven years later, our country was at war and people fought amongst each, between each other. It was called a civil war. And some people supported the king and some people supported parliament. And Portland fought for the king. Dorchester fought for parliament. Parts of Weymouth fought for parliament. And Kingston Russell was undecided. Lyme Regis fought for parliament. So wherever you went in Dorchester, you could be in, in dangerous territory. So we think, and it's not proven, but we think some soldiers were on their way to the house at Little Brady, Kingston Russell. The servants probably got to know about it, that the soldiers were on their way, going to raid the house. And so the master or the mistress of the house told the servants to bury the silver all over the fields so it could never be found. But for some reason, nobody went back to find this and that could be quite sad. So this all went to the British Museum and they put a value on it. So the question is, children, how much do you think that the jug is worth? Oh, that's a great question to put in the comment box there. So. Uh... For those people that are tuned in on Facebook or YouTube, use that comment feature. How much do you think the jug was worth or is worth, I suppose, is the question. Have your guesses in. It'll take about 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds for the guesses to come through. While you do that, I'll put some of those other photos up. Do the hallmarks give the date, Stuart? Yes. They tell you the date, the exact date, and they tell you the maker. And the maker has a PB and we've tracked him down, he's called Peter Bettersworth, and he was a goldsmith working in London in the 1630s. So it's come from London, it held water, and there would have been a big jug underneath it, but nobody knows where the jug is. The jug has never been, the, uh, the chalice, the bowl, has never been found. Joe says a thousand pounds, okay? Well done, Joe, that's a, that's a, a lily uh, going for £10,000. Whoa, scary. Jacob says 1100 and Ralph says £2,000. Again, we had no idea. We're just like you, children. Abel says £5,000. Well, it's made of solid silver. Isaac thinks £100. Wow, just think if you got this for your pocket money. £16,000 says awesome. Uh, Callie says, uh, yeah, 16,000 pounds, and Gary says three grand. Okay, well, I'll put you out of your misery. What happens is, it's quite a strange process, children. You, uh, the British Museum have a meeting uh, to decide on how much it's worth, and they don't invite you to the meeting. So you find something, and you give it to the experts at the British Museum, and then they have a meeting, and they all get together, sit around, and they have the jug in the middle of the table, and they say, right, okay, so how much do you think it's worth? And uh, Fred says, well, I think, um, well, I agree with Orson. I'm going to go with uh, 500 pounds or 3,000 pounds. And they all get together. They all put in their valuations, and then they write a letter to you, and they say, well, we think this is worth. And they said, we think this is worth £19,200. So, you think, okay, um, how did you get that answer? Why £19,200? So, that was a bit of a, a detective story here. How did they get that? But they don't tell you how they came to that price. So, they just say, right, 
take it or leave it. This is what we're going to give you. And uh, we're now going to offer the, the jug, the ewer, to all of the museums in Britain. And I wanted the jug to go to Dorchester Museum because I couldn't think of anything better because I'm a volunteer at the museum. And uh, we get school parties in there all the time. Not at the moment because it's closed, but I couldn't think of anything better than going, oh, I must take you to the silver collection. <laughs> and then I could just lean against the case and say, well, yes, yes, here's one I found earlier. But um, the landowner, uh, Mr. Sykes, he thought that 19,200 was not fair. So he said, no, this is not right. They're, they're not doing the right thing. So we had to write back to the British Museum and say, we don't think you're telling us the truth. And so the British Museum wrote back and they said, right, well, you prove that we, the experts, are wrong. Imagine that. All the experts in Britain on silver and you have to beat them at their game. And so it came back to me and they said, well, you're the head teacher. You know what to do. And I think I don't. I don't have a clue what to do. So I, I thought, well, I often watch Antiques Roadshow on the BBC on a Sunday night. So I thought a lot of them talk about silver. So I will. I will contact one of them. So I found one of the, the people on their website, Alistair Dickinson, and I Googled him and I found out that there was an Alistair Dickinson who had, um, who owned a shop in Surrey. So I thought, well, let's do it. So I, I made a call one day and said, hello, I'm trying to speak to Mr. Dickinson. Yes, I'm Mr. Dickinson. I said, oh, my name's Stuart McLeod. I found a silver ewer and I put it up on YouTube and we're now with the British Museum and they're offering £19,200. And I said, uh, I don't know if you know anything about anything. And he said, ah, let me stop you there. I've been watching this on YouTube. <laughs> I think, well, I didn't tell you. <laughs> but he, he knew all about it. So I said to him, is £19,200 fair? And he said, no, it's not fair at all. They're, um, they're trying to diddle you. So um, we had to go back and we were allowed to challenge the British Museum experts. Uh, again, we had to put a letter. We weren't allowed to go and meet the experts. And so we put a letter to them and we beat them at their own game. They had to admit that 19,200 pounds was not fair. So we beat them. But with that, what they did was they then said, right, well, it's worth a lot more. We'll offer it to all the museums. And it turned out that all the museums in Britain could now not afford it, which was a shame. So it went to the landowner, wanted it to go to auction. I didn't. I went to Christie's auction in London in 2014 and within two minutes it went and uh, it was bought for 48,000 pounds and um, 10,000 pounds disappeared in uh, value added tax and fees to the Christie's auctions so that took it down to 38,000 pounds the landowner got half of that, so that's £19,000. And the three of us, because I shared it with my other friends who were with me, we always share. Uh, so three of us shared £19,000. So you can work it out. There's your maths question for the day as to how much we each got. And with my money that I got from finding this, I bought a new detector but I lost the, the jug, I lost the ewer. It disappeared forever until, if we show you the last photo that Mr. Spracklin's got. Have you got the next photo please, Mr. Spracklin? The one of the ewer on its own, that okay. one. I found this the other day, children. <laughs> I've been searching and searching all over the world to see if anyone's found this. 
and who bought it at the auction in 2014, and I found it. And it is in New York, in the United States, and it's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And they, they were the people who paid the £48,000. And it's not on display. It's down in the vaults, not on display. No one will ever see it until they, unless enough people say, we want to see the Ewer. Um, I've written to them and said, how about you put it on display? And uh, maybe after we're allowed out, maybe we'll go over to New York and see it one day. But uh, so I can I can stand against this display case and say, yes, yes, I found this. <laughs> so that's where it is. And that's the end of our detective story. I think you're. I can't. I can't hear your. Oh, I was muted then. I'm sorry. I'm back. Back on now. I want to say a big thank you. Absolutely fantastic assembly. Lovely to hear your stories of metal detecting, and uh, we we really enjoyed that here, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, so thank well, you. You've woken up. You've woken up just in time. Uh, Orson says, "Good luck to getting to see your Ewer." Says Orson. Thank you, Orson. <laughs> and thank you everyone for tuning in um it's been a really insightful assembly and i'm sure lots of people want to get out metal detecting now stuart no problem if you want to learn i'm, I'm your man i'll help you <laughs> fantastic thank you everyone back at four o'clock for our next broadcast for today at pow thank you very much for watching everyone